to uh, do this in person if you could um and hopefully in the near future we uh, will be able to to get together um but for the time being i think we're well accustomed over the past 18 months um in in this mode of collaboration so um it's great to be um here with you anyway um uh, thanks for the introduction as you heard uh, you know work um it broadly in, in the um area of smart cities and a lot of work with IoT and urban data. I've got a background in computer science and a lot of work in security, building secure systems, software networks and so on. Um, but also looking into applications, particularly of um, Internet of Things uh, and its technologies uh, in um, energy, uh, mobility um, and built environment sectors. Um, the talk is an opportunity as part of sort of um, a reflection, if you like, this project that I'm going to give you some experiences from and what challenges we're facing looking into connected and autonomous or automated vehicles, um, whichever way you like it. There are a lot of people in the automotive industry that um, talk about, you know, autonomy is not here fully yet, so just call them automated. So I'm just, I'm using them probably mistakenly interchangeably, but, um, but I, I, I've used the term automated here. Um, for the sake of, of the argument. But um, we had a project that finished just before the pandemic um, that looked into infrastructures for connect autonomous vehicles, how physical and digital infrastructure will need to come together um, to accommodate the next stage of automobility, if you like, and what uh, some of the challenges would be, uh, particularly with respect to resilience, connectivity, security, and so on. So some of the work um, we've done in this, I've um, put on the slides uh, to point to more work that could be done in this space. And as I said, there was reflecting, there was plans to do more work on this, but then pandemic hit and, and a lot of it was shelved really. Um, uh, as we were trying to figure out what's the best way to to um, collaborate and uh, your priorities and so on. So you'll see some of the open challenges um, and I'll cover a broad spectrum that include both infrastructural issues, uh, but also user related. And uh, if, if you're in the more on the um, user experience and the human factor side, there's also a lot of um, um, open challenges for people who have interest in, on that side as well. And hopefully that'll be clear um, through the talk. Um, so this is where I come from. Uh, you had an introduction on um, Stair Log in Bristol and uh, Clifton Suspension Bridge there um, as a, a landmark. In uh, in our area, still in the southwest ourselves, a bit further up um, from Plymouth. Um, with respect to you know what I'm going to refer to, I'll give you a little bit about the project motivation background. Uh, project Flourish, the website's still up uh, up and running. You can get all the deliverables and the reports from from it, uh, and see you know the broad uh, the breadth of um, the challenges that across the board the partnership uh, worked on. Um, I'll go very briefly over the security state of art in a connected autonomous vehicle, well, you know, what components are there, what does it look like? Uh, and then I will uh, talk about a couple of pieces of work we did uh, and I was involved with. Uh, there was wider um, partnership that looked into a number of security challenges, but uh, I was looking in particular security by design uh, and also operational issues were whether people would be concerned of using um, uh, connected vehicle or, or connected an autonomous vehicle if they were to hand over uh, personal data and what would the challenges would that be and, and uh, you'll see later on um, part of that as well. Um, so Flourish was a, an innovative uh, UK uh, program um, in the southwest around the, the um, Bristol and, and Bath area and, and Cardiff um, partners um, were situated in, in that vicinity. Academic partners included us, um, uh, Bristol UWE, Cardiff University, and the Montford University, um, largely working in that space of connectivity and, and security. Um, we also worked with people, engineers, and uh, transport modelers. We worked with Age uh, UK as a charity that represented stakeholders who may potentially have difficulty accessing this kind of technologies. Um, and also in the view of aging population uh, and so on. Uh, so there was a wide variety of uh, partners in the consortium representing um, different um, interests and different perspectives on the issue of future mobility and especially 
uh, mobility that is dependent on connectivity uh, and autonomy. Um, so two challenges for us as technical teams coming in board on this, this partnership was to look into the wireless connectivity and the infrastructure required uh, to ensure that uh, you know that it's an operational uh, it is an operational state uh, that infrastructure and, and that is protected um, and and how we can do this by design how we can get to the engineers who will deploy the the physical and, and logical infrastructures um, in in space to think about security early on um, and also looking at the individual's experience as a as a user as somebody who's a passenger of a system like that and um, how this would be optimized in view of um, offering personalized services and of course with the word personalized comes the whole world of giving data about you and describing preferences and so on and, and so the world of data protection comes in very interesting on that interface as well and, and it's a broad interface with with security um i like this um quadrant here you know the description of what technology to cars these these days you know as you know, computer scientists would think of really as computers and wheels and it's not far from that in the sense that you know whether it's a self-driving or just a connected vehicle there's so much technology on board whether it's sensing technologies that will help with navigation and safety um position technologies that again will help with navigation and safety and and making the experience easier to allow us to um, uh, drive better faster um, uh, more aware of uh, our surroundings um, all that would depend on networking provision and connectivity uh, along um, the the space we're moving um, and potentially also other vision technologies that uh, could be embedded in uh, and you can understand that um, a lot of sensing technology is already deployed in conventional um, cars and let alone cars of the future. Um, anything from parking sensors all the way up to dashboard cameras and anything else that uh, we use today to make our experience better um, when we are on the road uh, in a car, even our mobile phone becomes part of that ecosystem either to serve as an entertainment um outlet or um help us with navigation and so on we can link it to uh, a dashboard in the car and we can take advantage of the combined capability so there's really uh, so much technology that um, that question about you know what can go wrong um it takes uh, to you know speaking to the converted to, to the converted here preach to, the, to uh, security students uh, um that um Every bit of technology you add to the car, you you broaden that surface that things could go wrong, whether deliberately or, or accidentally. Um, but the fact that we reshape mobility, automobility, based on on our cars in in ways that are precedented and create so much um, change, uh, but we also bring together all the challenges that the corresponding technologies that allow that to happen have in the native environment or, or elsewhere. We open up connectivity to the internet, you bring in all the vectors that may affect internet into um, mobility. Um, and of course, there could be proprietary technologies that um, things like communication with street furniture and street lights and so on, that, that will be a car to infrastructure thing, but it could be also just generally broadly accessing the internet through a technology that is brought in um, the car or connectivity through uh, mobile networks that would also enable um, technologies in car like GPS and others to, to um, be more meaningful and interact with the user and the car systems in, in ways that um, will transform that experience. Um, Many open challenges. When we start looking at it, you know, looking at the state of art and the literature, what can go wrong? Um, anything from you know tracking and knowing someone's whereabouts uh, with the implications of you know addressing and secure geolocation, um, protecting that kind of information, um, all the way to ensuring well, not necessarily security challenges, but could have security implications, robustness of the network, uh, especially when it works at real time and you've got moving um, vehicles that need to move from access point to access point um, and depend on 
communication messages for correct operation, for understanding the, the surroundings, communicating with other vehicles, and so on and so forth. So forth. So a lot of open areas for security researchers to, to take into account. Um, and a lot of solutions that come from you know this or other domains. It's just we felt, and I think it was sort of the literature thing that, that, um, that there are a lot of add-ons that that um, you know we would operate a, a scheme for future mobility, but we, the primary emphasis would be making it work and rightly it needs to work, it needs to work uh, safely. But uh, a lot of the security challenges, like security location, for example, would come to be solved afterwards. So hence the emphasis on. Uh, that we'll see a bit later on on the security um, by design and variety of, of ways to do that and one we explored um, through our own um, initiatives through, through the project but in general there are components that um, can be used to to that whether it's proactive security and everything you've learned with the building blocks of you know, secure hardware encryption um, public infrastructures that we'll see play a uh, a role into rolling out secure infrastructures for connected vehicles later on, a significant role. Um, reactive security in the sense that monitoring in the way that you would do in an enterprise network and looking at uh, um, specific incidents and anomalies that could indicate that something goes wrong. Uh, obviously, there are concerns both from um, a regulatory perspective, you operate a system that is based on potentially uh, sensitive information, so, so it's subject to all the uh, laws for data protection um, and other pragmatic aspects um, that may be required either as a user requirement that people don't want to be tracked, but or, or from a requirement from insurers or legal operation of a scheme. Uh, that includes mobility that is based on on cars and registered vehicles and so on. Uh, so there's a, a multitude of um, requirements. We'll see some bit more in more, more detail later and a, uh, and a multitude of solutions. Uh, it's just uh, on the onset, there, there's nothing by design, if you like, to, to, to um, create a secure system uh, in, in a way that um, you know you'd expect it these days in so, so, so software development and so on. But, but it's understandable because this is a domain that is now adding all this capability. Uh, and so that question about how do we do this uh, securely by design is an open question in itself. Um, typically, if you take it down to building blocks, if you like functional blocks, um, a system that would support this kind of mobility would look like this, anything in, in, on the car side, uh, you can see the connect autonomous vehicle sort of systems that would include things like um, communication module, um, a data recorder, a black box type of thing that would um, record some uh, elementary uh, status information um, about the vehicle uh, and potential key interactions with driver or, or others who control the vehicle. Um, communication buses um, locally and um, uh, security provisions for encryption of sensitive data on board and uh, also human machine uh, interactions and dashboards or uh, buttons or whatever. Um, there would be somewhere on the network, uh, some operating center type technology, the central station, intelligent transport systems, if you like, uh, that would have corresponding systems for enabling uh, communication and enforcing network policies and um, the traffic management and anything else that, um, you know, in a transport operation center would be um, under the, the remit. Uh, and also uh, things on, um, on the road as roadside infrastructure, roadside units that we deployed like access points, for example, down there at the bottom, um, where they would take into account, um, they would take care of vehicle to infrastructure, for example, communications and or support uh, other interactions between vehicles if they need to um, and provide this kind of conduit for connectivity uh, so that vehicles are connected to the operation centers and, and so on. And they're aware of infrastructure conditions and receive messages about congestion, for example, or other 
um, schedule or schedule events that may happen in the vicinity and so on and so forth. Um, so, you know, building blocks wise, um, a system that would support smart mobility, um, autonomous mobility would be like that. It's interesting to, to look at what kind of data is generated in this environment. This comes from the uh, German Association of Automotive Industry. I found it very informative in terms of, you know, what to expect to see all the way from sensor data down here uh, under F, technical data governing the vehicle and aggregated data um, that can be based on elementary processing of these, um, vehicle operating uh, data, for example, full status or battery charging, if we're talking about electric vehicles, um, rate of consumption of, of that resource and so on. Um, and so strictly operational data um, that on their own, they might not warrant any protection from a regulatory perspective. Um, but some of the aggregation of this data might be indicative that uh, you can infer something and maybe in, in um, in relation to uh, other known facts that you can have and maybe able to derive personal information. There's, for example, the suggestion that driving styles are uniquely potentially identifying individuals based on how people are moving about and uh, how fast and uh, acceleration, deceleration, and this kind of thing that it creates some kind of biometric signature, and in which case you may be able to, to infer information about an individual. But of course, that increases sort of the level of sort of sophistication and the raw data down here wouldn't be subject on the road into any kind of um, regulatory concerns. But the more we try to think of personalized services and how you link users to vehicles, whether it's their own vehicle or they use it as a service, if you like, and calling an Uber type service, um, the more you need to um, start um, thinking about protection of the data of that individual, their location, that is part of that, that becomes a sensitive information. Um, and you see here across the number of what they've done in this table uh, in that publication uh, that, as I said, is, I thought it was fairly comprehensive in sort of capturing what data is generated in the previous sort of um, architectural scheme and, and where protection requirements may um, be introduced um, all the way to things like uh, tracking location if you need to, um, offering navigational choices and offering advice about traffic congestion and things like that, that may all have an element of um, sensitive data involved in the production of that kind of um, uh, information. Um, and, and so there's applicable legislation that um, goes all the way up to, you know, European data protection, for example, or American sort of corresponding Authorities, there's also requirements for health and safety that um, talk about tracking specific data. We'll see in a minute. Um, uh, data that's generated on board, particularly operational data like down there, the E and F categories that are usually recorded in that um, black box I mentioned earlier. Um, things like vehicle status so that it can be recovered in case of an accident and be investigated in, in that sense. Um, so, up here, typical sort of example of interactions that you'd have in a connected highway, either vehicle to vehicle or vehicle to infrastructure. Um, say you've got you know, scheduled events like an accident and you, know, you, you may have vehicles that are able to inform one another that uh, they need to take care and reduce speed because there's some obstacle in front of them. Um, there may be notifications that you can generate at um, vehicle level that inform the infrastructure of the incident. Uh, and um, and so the response can come along the way and, and, and things like that. So there might be a multitude of uh, interactions that would take place with a number of um, um, messages that would be either for schedule or scheduled events. Uh, and if you like, even to the level of commands from the infrastructure to, to the vehicles to be mindful and obey sort of certain rules and so on as a network and, and, and traffic policy. So with respect to recording, that's an interesting um, uh, topic for us as, you know, looking into the data and, you know, uh, what can we find um, that could help with uh, explaining things, for example, from, say, forensics perspective. Um, 
this comes from the Department of Transport, one of the testing manuals for um, connected vehicles. And you can see that there, there's a requirement for a number of categories of information to be retained, things like vehicle speed, um, details such as whether the vehicle was operating in manual or automated mode, um, things like lights and indicator status, um, sensor data uh, concerning the presence of other road users, um, in front of behind the vehicle and so on and so forth. So all that could be potentially recorded uh, and found on board the vehicle. And it's interesting to know because as I said there might be security associations if even though they're operational data via aggregation or other correlations with perhaps contextual or open data um, that could be found um, to um, have some security implications. So it's good to know about that. Um, hopefully you can still hear me and see me. Yes, we can. Uh, I seem to have a... The image is getting a bit blurry and a bit distorted. Yes, I, I, I get the same here. So it might be my network on this end, but um, I apologize for that. Let's see if I can... Apologies for that. Let me stop sharing. Right. So I'm so sorry about that. I don't know what happened. It's okay. It's okay. Can you see? Am I still projecting? No. No. Because I see. There you go. Let's see how I can stop that. There you go. Right. Um, I don't know what happened, my apologies. So hopefully. We, we can see it now. Okay, I think I skipped, uh, it jumped a few slides. So let me go back here and say that. So there's a typical scenario of interactions in a connected highway and both on board and on the network, there will be interesting information across um, uh, the board in terms of not only of events of interest like this one, we have an accident, but clearly for the uh, normal operation uh, of the scheme. Um, there's a particular requirement that causes headaches to automotive and um, uh, operational engineers in the scheme. But uh, of course, if you are generating data that are potentially uh, of personal nature, if you know where who's using a vehicle and where they are, there's by definition sort of under um, protection of um, personal data and to DPR. And, and so there's a particular concern about uh, providing the right infrastructure for um, uh, um, ensuring that um, these requirements are, um, are well, well met. And so you know, from a privacy requirements perspective in, in this setting operation that I'm describing, you would have the regular um, requirements of you know minimum disclosure, so the least amount of information that is required for operation to be generated uh, of anonymity within reason. Um, there's here there's a perennial conflict of accountability versus how anonymous can you be uh, moving um, about in the streets when there are requirements for insurance, but also in case of an accident uh, of identification of vehicles and so on and so forth. So there's a balance there that is always fine. It's a very interesting problem. Um, there's a requirement for unlinkability, and I'll explain how this links to um, the encryption infrastructures that are used to protect privacy in, in this context, um, so that messages cannot be linked for a long time. So you cannot reconstruct or you know somebody's journey, for example. So you can track someone's vehicle at real time, um, and that um, this is not affected by if if you. If the credential of somebody becomes known and for whatever reason that you won't be able to uh, uh, recover all of the, you know, if, if, if one journey is of interest because uh, an accident happened during that time of the journey, um, you should be able to see the details for that journey um, and not for all the mobility or the past mobility of, of that particular uh, vehicle or, or individual. So there is a number of um, privacy requirements. The attempt to meet these are through familiar 
if you've done applied crypto, if you talked about um, um, public infrastructures, this is one of the solutions that uh, is uh, in, in place here. So, so a typical PK or sort of typical um, PKI infrastructure uh, is usually proposed. You see a lot of standards that um, um, what they do is sort of generate credentials for vehicles with the added uh, feature here that um, like registration of a vehicle or a user of the road, you get your own credentials. Uh, but those credentials are not used as such, but what they do is they enable you to generate pseudo um, credentials that are used during the course of a journey. And those pseudo credentials um, change frequently over the journey in strategies that I'll refer to in a minute, uh, so that it would allow if somebody was to observe mobility of a vehicle and by tracking the traffic and tracking those credentials, they wouldn't be able to link their pseudonyms uh, in a way that would be able to reconstruct your journey or identify the moving entity and so on. So, so there's a typical, from what it looks like, a typical PKI deployment where you have registration, certification authorities, uh, you register trusted entities, whether they are um, components of infrastructure like roadside units or vehicles or, or users of the infrastructure through some trusted uh, procedure like you would do in a PKI scheme. Um, and they all get their credentials and then the pseudo credentials are generated on the fly as we operate. So, so you can have uh, roadside units that are credited and they use their own credentials there and they um, uh, uh, right side and uh, on board units and vehicles at the bottom where they also um, generate the credentials and they use them to uh, operate in, in that scheme. So, so there's a, a PKI deployment that is tweaked uh, specifically to a mobility uh, scheme. It generates a lot of um, pseudonyms essentially that can be used on the fly as you move about and those are discarded and, and you create fresh credentials that are verifiably uh, coming from a trusted entity, but you never reveal your own uh, identity in that sense. And that scheme works well with a number of challenges that we'll see um, in a minute. It's, it's the accepted solution, if you like, um, in the mobility world. And there's that uh, European standard that I mentioned through the working group of um, the um, intelligent transport um, systems at uh, European level, uh, where they suggested exactly how to set up an infrastructure that will work like that. An interesting problem here comes with how do I manage the generation of the pseudonyms um, in order to hide people's identities at real time operational time. Broadly, there have been two strategies um, recognized, uh, one being what is called mixed zone strategy that is based essentially on location. So you've got certain um, geographical zones that you cause the vehicle or the entity to uh, refresh credentials and use a new pseudonym, um, and um, or uh, um, mixed content strategies that you allow the entities, the vehicles most likely, uh, to um, uh, determine when to issue pseudonyms themselves and they could be based for example on mileage or on uh, minutes of journey or there, there could be a number of parameters that could be taken into into account into this in order to generate a new credential and and there you've got the problem how often do i need to generate one uh, in order to uh, create a new pseudonym so that somebody couldn't stitch together the different parts of the journey in a way that would make sense um, in order to either reconstruct the route or, or reveal someone's identity. Um, and well, that applies to both strategies as a, as a generic sort of security and privacy problem. Um, and there are many papers in, in the literature that you can find trying to either implement attacks or deal with these attacks uh, from a control perspective by tuning the strategy parameters, how often and so on. Uh, and in general, the more the merrier. So you generate a lot of credentials, the, the more secure it is with operational overheads, which is part of one of the first things we did in this project to look at optimizing um, the deployment of such infrastructure. Um, because of course, the more the merrier from a security perspective, but it's not good from a network management perspective. You generate a lot of credentials. If you think of a typical mobility scenario, even post-COVID with you know people not necessarily moving as, as much as they did um, beforehand, um, you can imagine that over the network, you could generate tens of thousands, if not even you know, you know, different orders of magnitude or credentials, and that these need to be trafficked, these need to be communicated, downloaded on vehicles and so on. Because every time that um, 
a, a pseudonym is created and the old one is discarded, everybody in the infrastructure needs to know that so they know that the, the new credential as well as the old one. So they know that they talk to a legitimate entity in the, in the same way that you would do in a PKI scheme. So, so the mechanism to do that in a PKI scheme is the certificate or revocation list, um, which needs to be communicated to everybody. And it's a huge problem if you have you know tens of thousands of items to uh, download on vehicles that are moving and rely on real time communications, so that you know they're able to, if you, if they're part of V2X or V2V communications, to be able to do that. Um, with recognized what they see as recognized and authenticated entities. Um, so one of the things we did with the comms team um, in Bristol that uh, was involved with that is to implement um, serial distribution mechanism that would uh, implement a, a compression scheme, uh, a bloom filter that would use a hash functions and, and compression. Uh, and we found that this worked well. This is not really security, if you like, it's more of optimization of a security mechanism. And this was a, sort of our first experience into deploying an infrastructure first for testing and then um, understanding the challenges, appreciating that actually there's a lot of data generated here, uh, even though you know we're talking about just about the infrastructure a bit, let alone any content that might be um, circulating in the network, just the credentials in the, themselves a huge volume. Uh, and so one of the first things we did was to work on um, compression filters to be able to distribute uh, the cryptographic credentials in a way that uh, would be efficient from a network perspective. So this is something we, we published in a, a, an IEEE vehicular technologies um, conference a few years ago. Um, and uh, as I said, the trial showed that, that this sort of application of the uh, Bloom, as it's called, filter uh, was working well. So, so this is sort of the first, if you like, um, uh, take we had into, okay, what can we do in this space? Um, and uh, uh, and uh, affect some of the security systems at play. Uh, but as I said, our role was from the beginning thinking about, you know, reflecting on how can we embed uh, security design mechanisms in, in the design, uh, security mechanisms in the design of the systems from the beginning, rather than thinking, okay, well, you know, we can impose all these uh, measures uh, after um, the system is in place and operates as a cyber physical, you know, network plus physical objects moving about and interacting and talking to one another and so on. Um, so we thought about you know the design tools that people use in the space, and we looked at you know if you may be familiar with UML from software design, which a lot of in a, with a background uh, be familiar with that. But we also may be familiar with SysML, which is more or less the same thing with um, more uh, modeling conventions for physical blocks, for example, uh, and is also uh, able to um, model behavior in the way that you would do for software through interaction diagrams and so on, but uh, behavior of or of blocks and um, you know hardware components, if you like. So, so SysML that we found that is used uh, a lot in the design of automotive components. So it's a good uh, introduction, especially as there's a lot of work in secure UML and bringing UML and uh, uh, making UML a conduit for secure software design. And we thought of doing the same through um, SysML in what is called model-based system engineering way that a lot of the automotive, automotive companies use um, to design model their components before the manufacturing, the in-car components. Uh, and this is where, where we started. Um, we looked at the original data architecture and at the time, entirely opportunistically, um, I had a researcher working with me, um, I was a research student coming up from uh, Mexico, funded by Conocid, one of the research funders there, and, and staying with us in Bristol um, for a year. And he was working on developing a UML extension for uh, modeling security requirements in IoT. And so we found the opportunity to say, well, we're talking about connected vehicles, that was a lifetime of a project. Um, and we needed to sort of develop something that would be systemally type and include security requirements. So we married the two. Um, the um, EUML extension that David was developing as an IoT uh, modeling um, amendment, if you like, to the EUML standard, we made it a systemal equivalent 
and we added it into um, the design of uh, the Flores components. So here's an example of where we considered, for example, attacks against a LiDAR um, system, one of the sensors on board, and we looked into you know, denial of service and preventing sort of the, the information capture the LiDAR to come back to uh, the onboard unit and then communicate the network, but also looked into inserting false information um, so that uh, the LiDAR picks up you know, obstacles that are not there, for example. Uh, so we had a couple of scenarios. We modeled this with typical way that you would do in a, a system value or man way uh, with use cases using the IoT sec M notation, what fight for um, system L and noting the security requirements when things could go wrong. Um, in order to couple that with some logic, we used the um, fault trees here and would deliberately picked up to, to represent the risk if you like in running that scenario through something that would be able to, to give people that are not necessarily security minded and appreciation of how risk, you know, the, the level of risk and how, how risk could manifest in, in the enactment of a scenario like this. So we used a fault tree um, because it's something that automotive engineers work intrinsically with as part of the tool set. So we didn't use anything other specific, you know, very cyber or, or other methods. We picked up uh, one of their, their own tools and we modeled um, the outcome of a potential intervention uh, as a denial of service, for example, attack with uh, fault trees so that we communicated um, the scenarios with engineers who were designing the onboard units and, and the roadside infrastructure or deploying it. Uh, this is part of um, IT um notation for describing scenarios that can go wrong when you identify security requirements in the different IoT um, elements of a solution you're designing. Um, and ultimately, what we did was re engineered the data um, architecture to take into account all the security requirements that um, Flores was introducing, exactly because if you remember that table earlier, um, depending on what kind of data it was and regulatory requirements that may apply for privacy and security protection, all that was handily annotated in the eventual um, outcome of the um, data architecture where things needed to be encrypted at, at rest or communicated, encrypted and protected, uh, or otherwise um, controlled in a way that um, would make sense. Um, so, so this was a way we introduced um, security by design using, if you like, the tools of the same industry, uh, of the automotive industry using um, CSML and uh, MBSC approach and, and using elementary tools like fault trees to, to communicate risk with the engineers who are designing uh, the um, um, designing the solutions for um, deployment in the test beds and in the roads that uh, we tested the, the, the flora systems. Um, so what this introduced was a systematic, we found that we, we were able to produce a systematic documentation of the security requirements by doing this exercise from the beginning. Um, and that the security controls that were designed for the project were really um, purposeful design for the needs of the project and the one baseline in a way that we've got the system there and then we add security as we see fit. Uh, and that became clear to all. And uh, as a reflection, if you like, of the process of the three years working on the project, that a lot of engineers, automotive engineers and, and transport modelers that otherwise wouldn't have uh, appreciation of you know, security incidents and what could go on either at car level or at network level or uh, operating um, center level. Um, all these issues became a lot more explicit and a lot, you know, part of the um, understanding of the operation, which, of course, they're very sensitive to risk issues anyway in designing the systems, but they come from a safety perspective largely. Um, and, you know, they're very able to appreciate risk, but not necessarily the one that comes from the use of a or of a communications network um, in, in the way that, you know, cyber people will be more prone to, to appreciate. Um, by adding things like the fault trees and, and using that MBSC approach, the model-based systems engineering, we're able to simulate the logic of, a, you know, external um, security analysis techniques. And, and that was very handy uh, to, to create that interface, if you like, as I said, with, with engineers that, were no of no security background. Um, 
And we found that this kind of work lives behind in, in typical way that it happens in, in UML and security patterns, if you like, that if you model a few um, typical use cases that are representative of other systems as well, then you can have it as a as a design pattern almost that others can help, uh, can use and reuse for um, adding authentication into a scenario that includes connected vehicles, for example, or, or adding you know, other protection requirements. And, um for secure local localization and, and things like that so there's a start a repository of, of um, you know cases that somebody could start um without having to think from scratch kind of thing and so if that work was to be um carried on you know in a follow-on as, as we're saying we're thinking about sort of what to do next in in this kind of um setting and for then of course pandemic hit and then all went in the, in the cell but if this was to be um extended that kind of systematization of of security part design patterns that apply to this domain is something that could be looked at um as a as a further work so that's a one part of the work um that we're involved with and included sort of infrastructural elements i mentioned that the second bit we're going to um uh, refer to would be more on the operational side and i already mentioned there's a huge lot of you know, volume of data that is generated, uh, not necessarily the credentials, just the credentials, but all, okay, and the personal data, but but it's the content that is um, uh, trafficked over the communication network and so on, and, and all the service supporting information that comes um, with um, the deployment of um, of these networks, um, and so we wanted to see. If somebody was to offer personalized services over a connected vehicle, the scenarios we're thinking of were, for example, um, mobility as a service. So there's an autonomous vehicle that is part of an Uber type network. You press a button on your phone, and there's something, you know, a, a taxi comes in, nobody's driving it, you jump on it, others may be or may not be in it. Um, and you're sharing or not a ride, say, from the university to the train station or whatever. Um, and, and in that sense, there might be a number of services that, you know, that, that's one element of personalization. I have my own personal transport that will be on demand available if I need it. Another element of personalization would be for the vehicle to recognize you if you show a lot, if you allow it, because of, you know, the details that it's got from your phone in order to, for example, tune in to your favorite radio station or play the right music if you're you know, in the in-car entertainment system and so on. You can think many services like that. Um, but of course, that would re imply a level of, well, a consent that I, I'm happy for that kind of profile and personal preferences to be shared with the service provider and the vehicle um, and to receive this kind of um, service. Other types of service that we're thinking of for example, giving you personal choice on the route you want to take um, for whatever purpose, whether you want the fastest route or you want the slow, the, the most quiet route, or you want to, you know, the most privacy preserving, physically privacy preserving, so you're not seen, you know, in, in going from, from a part of the town that um, you'd be an artist and for whatever purpose, this kind of you know, route selection that could be part of a personalized service offer. And of course, there would be a balance there into how much somebody would be willing to share about the situation they're in, the, the personal profile and preferences in general, um, with a service provider or infrastructure provider of this kind of services. Um, so we started well, with a, working with a team of social scientists as part of a project, uh, looking at um, um, social science and management literature. Uh, you may have come across this. This is a, a late 80s sort of um, management science work on acceptance of new technology. And I think originally it was looking into things like consumer electronics and so on, but it's been used in modified versions across a number of technology innovations that we were confident you know, that this would also be applicable in the adoption of you know uh, connected autonomous vehicle services with the right tweaking that you'll see late, later on um, and this is largely talks about how people are likely or not to adopt a new technology based on how useful they think that new technology is um, and um, how how easy they think it is um, uh, to use it. So, so it recognizes two fundamental dimensions of, is it easy to use and do I think 
it's going to solve my problem uh, in a sense that then um, it gives a greater potential for this innovation to be um, adopted and, and used. Uh, and as I said, this is a established model. This is existing literature has been used in, you know, in numerous studies of very different technologies. So, so there's good confidence in that this is something that describes how people sort of adopt technology. I understand this principle in the literature as well in, in terms of how, you know, the brand and so on, but uh, I think we were satisfied that this is a good start uh, into considering um, adoption of craft services and trying to potentially relate it to um, the challenge of privacy that I mentioned earlier and how much data people would be willing to share in order to use this. So the second building block of this that would help with modeling you know, changing that TAM model technology acceptance model something that would be used in the context of um, uh, adoption of, of carbon in respect to sharing private data is something again that comes from cultural uh, from social science the cultural theory and risk and what type what type of people are prone or not to um, accept or you know avoid or you know a number of de develop a number of risk mitigation strategies that are related to um, whether they see they see more value into acting for the protection you know, down there there's individualism for example the, the axis described as i understand it as i said this is from a group of social scientists so um not necessarily something we're well versed into uh, as a computer scientist and engineer um, but is a model that um uh, makes sense in in that sense recognizes two dimensions and on this model here one is group or indiv individual dependence on you know a, a, an informal sort of you know grouping whether it's family friends um uh, a work organization uh, and so on or, or the work of an individual along the horizontal axis and great that as i understand it describes more um structure in society from very well established order with um hierarchy um command to more egalitarian towards the bottom of that, that that grid dimension and those are the types of people that emerge through this kind of categorization um, individualists if you like people believe more in sort of individual rights and and you know protection first as a um, of the individual as a unit, more egalitarianists that look into community benefits, um, hierarchists and fatalists that you know, suppose believe everything is uh, futile and um, you know, the world is going to end and that kind of thing with, with uh, all their technologies. So this is, a, I was thinking that this is relevant to public health potentially, you know, if you think of attitudes towards wearing masks and you know individuals or community benefit you know, where it to protect others and that kind of thing that, that that sort of describes the different types that you might potentially uh, come across there like anarchists that would take sort of the advice from the experts uh, and implement it and so on and people will think there's no point in doing this and whatever um so this is sort of the kind of background uh, that brings another model into this and and the next step was to combine if you like the two into by way of you know, structure creation modeling uh, into a technology acceptance model that would take into account um, perceived ease of use and um, perceived usefulness as per technology um, uh, acceptance model, but also um, willingness to share personal information and in relation to the risk levels that I see with that. I'm, I'm comfortable because I think, you know, I get something back in return and I value that this is better than the risk exposure that I let myself in by giving my name to Uber, for example, uh, or a similar platform um, and so on and so forth. So that's the trade-off here. So the, the amendment, if you like, to the typical um, TAM. Um, we added the dimensions that come from the cultural theory of risk that, that would look into how would people evaluate the case of revealing more about themselves in return for receipt uh, receipt uh, uh, or personalized information versus the risk they see through um, privacy you know, being tracked and so on and so forth. So that's a model with some hypothesis about how dependent variables would be influenced by independent variables. Uh, and 
what we did in the period of, uh, of the grant, uh, in the period of the project, we piloted a questionnaire that would combine the instruments from the two different models to make sure that it's workable. So, so when the objective wasn't to get to actual answers for you know, how people would behave, in, you know, would they give more information, but we're actually we're testing the questionnaire that is usable, that we can get um, data that makes sense. Um, and that we're able to uh, use it in then a wider study that would be the next step that uh, as it happened so far as I said this was just finished before the pandemic and ever since um, uh, the aftermath of the project as is formally finished has been shelved but there's something that we could get back to it um, and do actually the study that would be the wide scale with perhaps thousands of participants uh, where we would be able to observe um, uh, these parameters. So the pilot study included about 167 students and staff at the university. Um, it, it was a web-based survey and we examined a number of hypotheses about, as I said, how dependent variables with respect to how people would feel, would, would we feel uncomfortable, would they, you know, would they not share information and so on, based on, you know, how they viewed uh, connected mobility. Um, and how easy they thought it would, it would be to use and, and whether they'd be willing to share personal information in, in return for um, personalized services on, uh, on that as a number of hypotheses that we wanted to test and um, some preliminary um, uh, results. Anything that you see not is, means that is in, in, not determined um, based on the data we have, you can see that we can understand that the data is biased in the sense that 167 people from the same institution have all been students. They're not exactly representative of society, so there's some associations that are not representative. But as I said, we were, we were testing whether the combined questionnaire of time and cultural risk theory amended with privacy questions that were sort of the contribution from our team to those two instruments would work as a single instrument to collect the data we want and, and that successful that, that work and they, something that was interesting uh, even though the sample is not representative is that um, the primary concern that comes from the questions that we examined was that there's still concern about uh, physical safety would i trust a, a driverless vehicle to you know get in there and is it safe and is it connected in real time and you know if something happens will i be protected and that's you know if somebody um if there's an accident um so and i think it makes sense uh, because it's such an early period of you know looking into these technologies that people are not really necessarily thinking about cyber yet so so the privacy and the certainty data was sort of an after thought after the first concern, which is, can I safely use this technology? Can I jump in and press a button and not having to intervene with the steering and everything else? Um, and I suspect that this would be even more, that's a wild guess, but if we were to do this questionnaire with participants from Age UK, for example, uh, that would be even more decimated. If, if you're thinking that this is a concern of more, a younger population and, you know, um, that, that in, in the university, that maybe that uh, somebody who's sort of retired, you know, pensioner, whatever, would be even more concerned about using the technology. So that's sort of one thing that came out. Another thing that um, came is that uh, types that were more on the individual, sort of more entrepreneurial types and sort of pushing, but also people who see the benefit from communities were more um inclined to the bottom end of that cultural theory risk for other individuals so um, egalitarians would be more prone to use more advanced services um either because they see the entrepreneurial you know the, um, aspect of this or, or in the value or because um they see community benefits in the sense that you can share rides uh if obviously to share rides you have to share data um with um uh, others who may want to be in the same area and you know go to the same place and and then share physically the vehicle with them and, and so there's a community benefit in the sense that you can say well reducing the amount of journeys and so on and co-using a vehicle and and so you can see why these types and that make sense even from the preliminary data that these type of risk um um how, how would you call them these types of risks attitudes uh, on the bottom of the, the cultural theory um, space that we're more prone to use this kind of system. Um, and um, ultimately the ambition 
would be to be able to calculate the probability of somebody deciding to use a connected autonomous vehicle based on, um, you know, as, as you would in a typical um, statistical sort of um, analysis uh, of this problem to find the probability of somebody using this uh, as an expression of um, the independent variables of perceivedness of use and um, perceived usefulness and uh, willingness to share information and uh, perceivedness, uh, perceived benefits from, from receiving this personalized factor. And hopefully this is something that can be specified um, now. And uh, would, could, would this be used? Um, I think for service designers is an interesting thing that they would be able to pre-specify, identify the boundaries for different types of users of where service innovation would stop in terms of asking for personalized data. And, and to the moment, you know, you could sort of identify the moment that you compromise someone's perception of, oh, this is unacceptable for me. I don't want to give you that data. And so offer them a, a range of services that would be uh, in line with their profile, if you like, of, of risk attitude. And this could be useful in the sense that you actually offer a personalized service in line with legislation in a way that not, not automated, but it's well considered from the beginning, from the onset. Um, and, and so you're not getting blanket everyone or, or you know, trial and error and, and, and try to convince them, you know, in a, in a way that they should get one on, on board with a service or another, but uh, rather to offer them exactly what's, what's right for them. And that could be interesting in the design space. Um, so I think that's all I had. There was another piece of work that was interesting. Uh, I wasn't directly involved. Uh, it, it involved machine learning application um, of um, analyzing anomalies on the uh, traffic, on the network traffic. Uh, and that's something that uh, was done by De Montfort. And there's on the Flores side, there's a, a report on that and, and a paper somewhere. Um, so, so you can, I'm, I'm pointing to that, I want to produce, I said I wasn't involved with that, um, but uh, it's more about the network side and, and the security on the network, network side and, and anomaly detection. Uh, so it's a very interesting piece of work and you, you can find the report from um, the website if, if that's something, you know, you want to you know, think of projects or whatever, um, MSC dissertations in this space and, and is of interest, you can find all the papers that I mentioned here and, and the reports on the Flores. So, so here's some background. Um, anything that is boldface is, is our own output, um, partly describing the work that I mentioned on um, uh, embedding security um, in the design of the components and also looking at the operational aspects in the service provision and privacy perceptions. Uh, and the rest are good foundational papers on uh, discussing uh, risk in automotive systems that are connected and autonomous. And uh, also, um, especially around the PKI deployment in uh, connected uh, mobility situations and the pseudonyms and challenges you get by trying to maintain anonymity by the use of the mechanism of, um, of pseudonyms. So I think I've talked enough for an hour. I've talked enough, so I'm very happy to answer any questions. I'll stop sharing. And um, thank you for your attention. And uh, I'm very happy to, to open up questions. Um, uh, questions and answers. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yep. My screen has hanged, so you know, I, so I, I'm not sure I, whether I, you know, I was muted or not. But um, are there any question? Uh, please raise your hands. Um, though I can't see anything at the moment, uh, but you can unmute yourself and ask a question or pop them in in the chat window. My screen is hanged. I'm trying to log in from another device. So please, if you have any questions. We can see you normally. Yeah, we don't, uh, at least I don't have any problems like I had earlier. The thing is, you know, I can't, I can't see anything at the moment.